Hello? Hello. All right. <clears throat> I think this would be the first time that we're going to have uh, a worship service in English. And um, I still remember it was, I think, years ago, I met a wonderful woman at Alternative. We talked about the ministry that God gave us. And we also share the ministry that we have. She has so much patience for the Christ she served. And I told her, if God had a plan, I really wish her to come to our church and share the word of God. And that woman, that wonderful woman is here. Pamela, could you please stand up and let's give her a poll. And please come forward. And that dream, I believe, come true tonight. So thank you so much. And um, I am, I speak English as a third language or the fourth. I'm not sure, so I'm still struggling. But I hope I can be your interpreter. But I don't know if you guys need interpretation. No, totally not. So, boy, little how are we going to do it? How many of you do not understand English? No one. I believe 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So... We don't need interpreters, so you, you can you can preach in English. Yeah. All right. Let's welcome her again. Thank you. That would be great. Um, and actually, when I teach, I use my hands a lot and I walk a lot. So, um, are you recording this or something? Is there a reason I need the mic? Yeah. Oh, okay, then I'll be obedient. No, <laughs> all right, and use the mic. Um, it is a blessing, my kids. There is a feeling in this house where I am a woman of God, no doubt about that. I am an educator, no doubt about that. But I'm also uh, a parent. I'm also a mother. So I'm probably going to go back and forth from educator to woman of God to mother mode because I feel you. I feel, man, that you are seeking something. I pray that it is a desire to truly know who you are in Christ. That's why I want to start with what is it we believe? Who do you say he is? As you kids are deciding what it is, and that is a term of endearment when I call you kids, that is it. I tell my college students that, I tell the parents that I teach that, it is. So don't get offended by that, that is love. When you kids, while you are deciding what it is you believe about the things that we as your overseers, we as your covering tell you, one of the most important things, again, is for you to decide for yourself who you say the Christ is. That is key to our walk as believers. That is key to Christian culture. So we're going to talk about that tonight, too. 
culture, what, and this is interactive, tell me this, what does the word culture mean to you? Way of life? Anything else? Traditions? Very good. Anything else? That's it. it in, in the dictionary, it actually says that culture is, it is a way of life. It is made up of traditions. It is made up of, of belief systems. It is made up of art. It is made up of language. Okay. Ah, and speaking of that, Minglaba. Boom. A. <laughs> Okay, that's it, uh, that's it, <laughs> right. But um, when we talk about culture, it is just that, a way of life. Tell me something that sets Burmese culture, what, what identifies that, what defines Burmese culture? What do you think? Oh, community, very good. What else? Family ties. Family ties. Okay, good. Yes, food. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so that is what you think of for your culture. What we're going to talk about is what folks should think about when we are talking about Christian culture, okay? There are many ways, ra racial culture, um, ethnic culture, but what I feel is that our Christ, our culture of Christ transcends that. And it actually connects all of us, whether we speak the same language, whether we look the same or look different. It's the blood of Christ that covers us and our belief in him connects us and I feel that in this house, which is why I'm excited <laughs> to be here. So let's talk about that. Um, as I was studying, I actually did this presentation with about uh, 250, 300 young people who were coming through um, and studying about, learning about different cultures. So they asked if I would come and somehow, uh, it was held at a church, but they were talking about lots of different things and they asked if I would um, talk about somehow cultures. So I researched what Christian culture actually is. And what I found were there were four, four principles really that our Christian culture are built upon. So we're going to talk about those tonight so that as you are deciding what it is you believe, if you haven't decided already, you are clear on what it means to be a follower of Christ. Is that okay? Is that cool? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, yes. Huh? What Oh, this is transmitter. I'm sorry. This is not my this is for me. I'm sorry. Oh no problem. <laughs> oh. Okay. Oh. We will let him get set. Okay, are we ready? Ready? Okay. All right. So, oh, before we go there, may we have, may we play the film? I think that the first thing that we need to determine as followers of Christ is whether or not we believe Jesus was real. 
Now, I am an analytical thinker. I'm also a critical thinker. So it, I like researching things. I like, <laughs> I like um, evidence when it comes to faith and belief systems that kind of goes against what faith actually is. We don't need evidence for faith. If we had evidence, then we wouldn't need faith. But the cool thing is that this film is going to provide some evidence, some proof on the existence of Christ. So we are ready. There are many myths about Jesus. In these programs, we're talking to some experts who can help us get at the facts behind the myths. The first myth we are exploring is the claim that Jesus never even existed. So what evidence is there for him apart from the accounts in the Bible? The idea that Jesus didn't exist at all is uh, an exercise in excessive historical skepticism that pays no attention to history whatsoever. Uh, there's um, a challenge which has gone out on the um, uh, in internet uh, by uh, someone called John Dixon who said he would eat a page of his Bible if uh, someone could find a uh, tenured uh, faculty member of uh, a ancient history department who did not believe that Jesus Christ existed. Uh, it, and so far he hasn't had to uh, do that. Um, we have terrific evidence not only for the existence of Jesus in, in, a, in a whole array of Christian materials, but we also have evidence for him in materials not written by Christians, by the Jewish historian Josephus, for example, who has a text in Antiquities Book 18, 63 and 64, that describes Jesus as someone who did unusual work, someone who was crucified under Pontius Pilate along with the instigation of Jewish leaders, and someone who formed a movement that became known as, as Christians. The very reputable Roman historian Tacitus refers to Jesus being crucified under Pontius Pilate, so that's a central aspect of Christian faith that is confirmed by this Roman historian who's actually quite hostile to Christianity. There are uh, approximately a dozen references in the oldest Jewish and Greek and Roman sources that uh, are not uh, by any means Christian testimonies. And if one puts together a, a composite picture of what we can learn from those sources, uh, not only do we know that there was a, a man, uh, a Jewish teacher, uh, early in the first century in Israel by the name of Jesus. Uh, we know that uh, he had uh, a brother named James. We know that his ministry intersected with another man by the name of John, who was famous for calling Jews to baptism. We know that as an adult, he gathered uh, disciples. Uh, five of them are named. Uh, we know that uh, the rumors circulated that he was born out of wedlock, um, that he ran afoul of various Jewish authorities because of what they thought was uh, heretical teaching, that he was ultimately um, arrested and uh, crucified under the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. That comes from uh, Tacitus in the early second century so that we can even narrow the date of his death without once consulting Christian sources uh, to Pontius Pilate's time as governor in Judea between 26 and 36 uh, AD. Uh, we know that uh, uh, the report circulated that people claimed uh, to have seen him alive again and uh, as a result continued to believe in him as Messiah and even uh, we are told uh, by Pliny to uh, sing hymns to him, worshiping him as if he were a god. And also, without Jesus existing, you can't really explain the origins of Christianity, uh, the teaching attributed to Jesus and so on. It, it would just be a historical non-starter. On top of that, we can trace uh, the unbroken existence of the Christian church, of the community of his followers from the the very first uh, decade after his death, probably in AD 30, some would say 33. And so uh, the uh, uh, claim that we can't know Jesus existed is, 
is simply absurd. Uh, people who, uh, who would make that uh, charge are very poorly informed. What I'd always ask with people is to be consistent. So if they want to say we can't know that Jesus was a historical figure, they're also going to have to say we can't know all sorts of other things. So a lot of the time people want to have a harsher rule of evidence when it comes to things about Jesus than they do about other areas. The claim that Jesus never existed is a myth. The fact is that he was a real person in history, and there's plenty of evidence for his life apart from the Bible. Evidence that confirms the main events of his life as the Bible describes them. But one reason people don't believe the Bible's accounts of Jesus is because of all the miracles in them. He walks on water, he raises the dead, and so on. Next time, we'll explore whether the miracle stories make the Bible's accounts unbelievable. Okay. Ah, this is much better. I love that short film, and I love to start with that because there is evidence that Jesus lived. What I'm concerned about and what we need to think about is who do we say he is, okay? And that's the same question that was posed back when he was alive. I need somebody to find Matthew 16. Matthew 16, let's see, let's go to 13. Matthew 16, 13 through 20. It says, and I'm reading from the New King James Version, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say? that I, the Son of Man, am. So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, who is in heaven. And I will say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I love that. Who do you say that I am? Okay. When we are walking out this earthly existence, just like in Jesus' time, there is multiplicity of belief systems. There are things that can pull you away from the true culture of Christ. There are things that can muddy what we know Christianity to be. So we are going to talk about those four foundational principles that set our culture of Christ apart. The first thing is we know that we are sinners, okay? We know that we have separated ourselves from God. Let's go back to what a sin is. What does, what is sin? Anybody. And I love this. Because I was, I was an adult before I knew 
that sin wasn't a behavior, okay? Sin is a state of mind. Sin is when you think you know better than God, when you become the one that drives your decisions, your behaviors, when there is a refusal a refusal to submit to the will and the word of God, it's a mindset more than a behavior. We, first principle, is that we acknowledge that we have the potential of separating ourselves from God, of becoming our own gods, essentially. Let us go back to the Garden of Eden. Let us go back to Genesis. Have you studied about Adam and Eve? Love them. They're great. (laughs) First, man, woman. But they show us everything that we as human beings can still do today that can separate us from God. What's the one thing that Father God asked Adam and Eve not to do? Say it again. Mm -hmm. Not to eat the fruit from the tree. Okay. Eve was confronted by the enemy in the form of a snake when he asked her first time, what is it you were told not to do? Did Eve know? Did she tell him? Well, God said not to eat of this fruit. She did. And then the enemy asked again in a different way, And rather than repeat what she knew that God had already said, she started thinking, okay, well, you know, I think that's what he said, but it would be kind of cool to be wise, wouldn't it? It'd be kind of great. You know, it looks good, so it probably is good. All right, maybe, maybe it wouldn't hurt if I did. Okay, that's what we do, all right, as human beings. If there's something that jumps off, okay, we know what we're not supposed to do, (laughs) all right? We know that there are boundaries that are established. However, we start to think, "Ah, it might be okay. It might not be that big of a deal, all right? And then we step into it. And then we have... Adam, whom I love as well, who was to be in the position of covering, yet he was influenced. And rather than take his place and say, baby, please, uh, I wish you hadn't done that, (laughs) okay? I wish you had not eaten of that fruit, but I got you. I'm going to stand and cover you and say, Father, I'm sorry. Okay, yes, she did, but... Um, please, you know, I'll take it. I'll I'll take the hit. (laughs) Is that what he did? Uh, No. He was like, okay. (laughs) I'll, I'll, I'll try it too. All right. We all have the potential of being influenced or just forgetting or rationalizing our behaviors. That right there is what it means to be moved by the flesh, to be born out of sin, to have that potential to stop submitting to what God has said and to do what we want to do. First principle, we got to admit that. Okay, We got to admit we are sinners. Second principle, Jewish tradition... um, Before Christ, the Jewish church, they had put in place a process where if sins did occur, 
you had to bring a sacrifice to atone for that sin. Okay? That's a part of Jewish religion, which is what Christianity is born out of. So, I actually researched this and actually talked to um, a member of a messianic synagogue because I wanted to understand that whole process. I was told that there are three reasons for um, sacrifice. The first one is just that, you know, atonement. You are saying you are sorry for something that you have done. The second is it's a replacement for you. Instead of you bearing the brunt of the punishment, the sacrifice bears the punishment for you. Okay. The third is so that you will be drawn nearer to God. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> Does this sound like maybe what the Christ did for us? He took our place. He bore the brunt of the punishment that we were supposed to have thrust upon us because we had moved so far away from God that there was nothing that man could bring to God to, to cover the sin, to cover the rebellion, to cover the moving away from him. So Father God loved us so much that he gave his son to pay that price for us. Through our belief in him, we draw closer to God as we are reconciled with him. Is this making sense where this Christ comes from? We are saying we are sorry, so we didn't even have to bring anything, but all God wants us to do, all our Father wants us to do is believe who he said Jesus was, who Jesus said he was, our Lord, our Savior, the Son of Man, but the Son of God. Okay, so... Number three principle. I think I probably already said that. We have to confess that. We have to say it. All right? We have to confess that Jesus is Lord. I'm going to back up. That's actually four. I love the confession part of it. The third part Let's go back to the sacrifice. With the sacrifice of Jesus, he was placed on the cross. He did die on the cross. Did he stay in that state of death? No. He was brought back to life, which is called resurrection, correct? Okay. So actually, confession is not the third principle the resurrection is the third principle, okay? First principle, what did I say that was? I know, I see you're taking notes. That's what I love. What's the first principle? What's the second? Okay. And that Jesus was our sacrifice. Third is that Jesus was resurrected from death. That sets us apart, our belief that, yes, he paid the price, but he is not still buried. We believe that he was brought back to life and that through his resurrection, and number four, through our confession of our faith in that, that we are saved, that the Holy Spirit that we now have access to because he was brought back to life. The Holy Spirit that was breathed into those followers in the upper room, that same Holy Spirit now indwells each one of us who confess Jesus 
is Lord. That is Christian culture. So I value, I value diversity. I think it's great. I, I, I love that. But when I need to know that I know that I know what someone believes, especially when they are professing and confessing to be a follower of the Christ, I look for those foundational things. And I ask you to look inside your hearts. See if you believe this. It's your choice, not mine, not your parents. You know, as much as parents hate it when I say that, but they know it. You kids are getting, <laughs> seriously, you kids are getting to that age where you have to decide for yourselves what you believe. It was difficult. My children are now 21 and 26, 21-year-old son, 26-year-old daughter. Walking them through that process, it was hard to back up. I'm praying. I still pray for them. And I love who they are becoming because they have decided what they believe for themselves. And they're walking it out. And now it's between them and God. I'm on the sidelines, that's for sure, doing my prayer thing. <laughs> you better know that. And every now and then, if I see something crazy jumping off, you better know mama's going to say something too. <laughs> but it's going to be done in a way where I'm coaching, where I'm teaching and done in a way where, man, I'm not talking about something that I'm not walking. So I encourage all overseers to be walking this thing, too, because our kids are watching what we're doing. All right. Is this making sense to you, kids? Yeah, cool. All right. Oh. Let us let us go to With confession, Romans 10, 9, and 10. It says, if you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from death, you will be saved. For it is, it is by our faith that we are put right with God. It is by our confession that we are saved. If we believe these things, then we are justified. We are made right with God. We are made righteous because of the price that Jesus Christ paid. Not because we're acting like good people. Not because we're working really hard. Works are important too. Faith without works is not good. But faith is the key. Faith is the catalyst to the Holy Spirit being able to equip you to do what you need to do in every circumstance. I love that because um, I, I did not choose um, learning to see beyond circumstance and act beyond feelings as the title for this. I really didn't have a title, but that is that ties into the third day. The complete title for the third day is Keep Moving Forward, Learning to See Beyond Circumstances and Act Beyond Feelings. As you kids are continuing on this walk, you better know that is key to us being able to stay on the path because there are going to be difficult things that come at you. Have any of you ever had anything difficult happen? Have any of you ever been disappointed before? What does being disappointed mean? Yeah, things didn't go the way you thought. When you get disappointed, that can the way you respond to that can actually 
empower you or it can lead you to a place of despair. We talk about that and I teach that. I'm going to throw this in tonight just because this pattern, you need to get it in your head. And for those of you who were, uh, were any of you at the youth rally last year? At Any of you? Okay. I talked about this there. I'm just going to do it briefly because this pattern is something that you need to understand too. Write this down. Disappointment leads to disillusionment. Leads to discouragement. Leads to despair. And there was a pastor several years ago who I heard teaching that, teaching that continuum right there. And as soon as he got to the despair, my spirit rose up because one of the verses that I always stand on is 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9. It says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are confused, perplexed, but not in despair. We, and, and when he said that disappointment could lead to despair, my spirit went directly to, uh-uh, no. Because the word tells me that I may not even understand what's going on, but we don't move to a place of despair. The rest of that verse, those verses say we are persecuted. We feel like there are things coming at us to overtake us, but we are not abandoned. We are knocked down, but we are not destroyed. That's war talk right there. That's what these next couple of days are going to be preparing you for, to war in spirit realm, to war for your relationships, to war for your relationship with God through Christ, to overcome the things that are trying to take you out, get you off your path, make you turn away from Christ. I oversee an organization or a campaign called Regen Next. We want to regenerate thinking. We want to restore and renew. So as I was studying this and as I was listening to that pastor teach, my spirit was rising up, and I knew that there was something to counter it. So my, my thoughts were regenerated, and I looked at that continuum, and the Holy Spirit said, yeah, disappointment's going to come. So get ready for that. There will be things that don't happen that you thought would. Next step with disillusionment, though. What is the root word of disillusionment? What is the word in the middle of disillusionment? Illusion. What is an illusion? Is an illusion something real or not? It's not real. So becoming disillusioned Actually, the Holy Spirit was like, that's a good thing, okay? Because now you know. You were disappointed because it didn't work out, but now you know truth. So you know how you need to respond. The illusion is gone. Even the illusion about other people, or sometimes the illusion about yourself. Does that make sense? So disappointment can lead to disillusionment. That's cool. Because now you see the reality of it. Next step can lead to discouragement. What is the root word of discouragement? Courage. Have you ever felt discouraged? You don't want to keep going. Rather than, and I've had people tell me this, you know, you just need to relax. You need to rest. That's great. I'm like, yeah, definitely take a nap. 
get, get some sleep. But the root word of discouragement is courage. You're going to have to tap in to courage in order to keep pushing past what has disappointed you in order to take a look at the truth of the situation. You have to have courage to do that. The word tells me, what is that? We were not given a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. So we have what it takes to tap into the courage to keep moving. Okay. And then with despair, you know, you already had my verse for that. Here's what the Father said to, or the Holy Spirit. He was like, the next stage that people deal with, with despair, because there's no hope. Have you guys, um, do you know that there's a, an epidemic now pretty much of depression among young people? You guys know that? When someone is in despair and they have no hope, it can pull them in that place of depression. Okay. So I teach this to young people too because our Christ can help counter what is coming at us to pull us into that place of depression, to pull us into that place of despair. I'm a mental health advocate too, so by all means, get some help, but do not think that there's not a spiritual issue that needs to be addressed too, okay? All right. All right, so I had them print off. Um, yes, beautiful. Is that translated into? Oh, awesome. I'm going to go get a copy I can read. Hold on. <laughs> Let me see. I had um, this printed off for you, and I wanted to share it with you because a part of what we get as being members of the body of Christ, as being followers of the Christ, <laughs> being a part of Christian culture is... It is not just who we say he is, it is who he says we are. And that's what this list is. This is taken from a book called Victory Over Darkness, which is phenomenal, by Neil Anderson. And at the end of it, he had all these who am I statements. Okay, we know, again, who the Christ is, Son of God. You know, God is Elohim, the creator, El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty, Jehovah Jireh, our provider, Jehovah Shalom, our peace, Jehovah Nisi, everywhere. God, you are Jehovah Rapha, our healer. There are so many names for God, and we should know them, but I want you to know who he says you are. Who am I? I want you to read these, and you can read them in, in your language. I want you to say it out loud. We're going to, and you, you'll have to follow along. What's the first one here? I am the salt of the earth. Yeah, I am the salt of the earth. Actually, we're just going to go down the line. If you don't want to read, that's fine too, but say that first one. I am the what? The salt of the earth. Okay, say the next one. I'm the light. Good. I am the salt of the earth. Okay. Okay. I am the salt of the earth. Okay. I am the salt of the earth. Okay. I am the light of the world. Okay. Okay. I am the salt of the earth. Okay. That's good. I am the light of the world. Okay. I am the light of the world. Okay. I am the sun of the earth. I am the dew of the earth. Okay. I am the light of the world. Okay. I am the light of the world. Okay. I am the salt of the earth. I am the light of the world. Okay. Okay. 
of here, sir? Um, oh, okay, we got to, um, I am an heir of God, I am a son of God. I am a saint. I am a saint, okay. Okay. Uh, we got to, I am a saint, so after that. Mm, okay. Fellow? Okay. 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 There it is. Yes. All right. I am an expression of the life of Christ because he is my life. Wow, that's sweet. I am chosen of God, holy and dearly loved. I am a son of light and not of darkness. I am a holy partaker of the heavenly calling. I am a partaker of Christ. I share in his life. I am one of God's living stones being built up in Christ as a spiritual house. I am a member of a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. I am an alien and stranger to this world in which I temporarily live. I am an enemy of the devil. I am a child of God, and I will resemble Christ when he returns. I am born of God, and the evil one, the devil, cannot touch me. I am, a, I am born of God. We're going to say that again. And the evil one, the devil, cannot touch me. I am not the great I am, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. I'm telling you kids, this is who he says you are. Um, just as a quick exercise, um, I want you to circle mm, five. All of them are important, but as we were going through, I think probably there was something that jumped out at you that maybe you are in need of saying that to yourself. I want you to circle those. And then of those, I want you to choose one. And on the back of your paper, I want you to first, you know, meditate on that, pray about it, recite it to God yourself, and then say, Father, show me what you want from me regarding this. Show me what I need to do with this. as a part of what you're writing, thank him. Thank him for filling you up. Thank him for giving you this word and the knowledge of who you are in him and the ability to walk it out, the ability to receive.
where you are, you guys create like a little small group and share. You can break up however you want, but share what you wrote. Encourage each other. Pray for each other if you need to. Okay. Um, I love this part where you're actually engaging with each other. Did you get anything out of this? Um, gentlemen, did you get anything out of this? No. <laughs> Not a problem, son. No. Did you get anything out of this and sharing with each other? I hope so. And it will be, um, we will continue in this vein. I do not just ever lecture. Um, there always has to be engagement, I think. I, number one, don't really want to hear myself talk that much. Um, but I love uh, to get feedback. 
so that you, so that, and it's not so much that I know that you're processing, but so that you know that you're processing, all right? And you're open to the leading of, of the Holy Spirit. This is, this is good stuff, kids. I mean, it's, it's foundational stuff, but the things that we will be talking about over the next couple of days, um, these are things that I want you to hold on to, and they can help you as you grow um, as followers of Christ. Um, are there any questions do you guys have? Anything you want to ask? Okay. Um, tomorrow we are going to talk about love languages. Have you heard of those before? No? Okay. Um, there is a... Um, He's a writer at this point, but he was also an anthropologist, and he's a family counselor. His name is Dr. Gary Chapman. And he wrote a book back in the 90s called The Five Love Languages because he noticed that marriages were falling apart. And he theorized, or he hypothesized that, okay, there, there's something that we're not doing. He hypothesized that there were ways that we give and receive love. Um, and he chose uh, five ways um, based upon the counseling that he had done with families. So that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow, are the five ways that we give and receive love. But we're going to take it a little deeper. We're going to do an assessment so that you can determine what your love language or languages are. But then we're going to take a look at... Um, how we can use that to relate to God, okay, and take our relationship with him a little deeper. All right? All right. Um, with that, may I pray for you? Yeah. I know y'all getting out a little early. Uh, is there a song you want to sing? I was, I, I was asked <laughs> back there, do you guys want to do a little bit more praise and worship or anything, or are y'all good? Pastor, you good? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. I am just going to pray then. Um, Father God, uh, we just come before you, first and foremost, just giving you honor. You are the most high God, creator of heaven and earth, and your son, Jesus Christ, is Lord. There is no name that is above his name, and we thank you so much for loving us first and best. Jesus, we thank you for your obedience and for being the perfect example of what it means to bend our will to the will of the Father. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who now indwells us and equips us, empowers us, brings to our recollection whatever we need, Father. We thank you. We love you. I pray for each person, each family that is represented here today. I pray that their faces will be turned towards you, God. I pray that hearts will be healed if necessary. I pray that spirits will continue to grow and mature, that each one will choose to follow you through your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for this time. You have opened my eyes, Father. I thank you for this beautiful family of God that I see we are called to be. I thank you for connection, for shared vision. I pray for equipping. I pray for resources. I pray for opportunity, whatever this house of God needs. I pray that you will provide out of your riches, God, out of your abundance. Continue to protect and strengthen the man of God of this house and his wife. I pray for their covenant that they are covered and that they go closer and closer together as each one of them seeks to become closer to you. We honor you with all that we have. We ask that you forgive anything that we may have done that has offended you. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Ah, oh, hey, okay. <laughs>